I'm glad you are all here. Uh, can you please stand as we keep singing?
You may be seated. Well, the first thing I want to say this morning is just how wonderful it is to be with all of you and to be worshiping together and celebrating God's presence here with us. And it's good to see some faces that I haven't seen in a while and see you back here again uh, if you've been in Florida and others that have been, been away. So we're excited to be here. Now, one of the great things that we can do as a community together is we celebrate special things. And, and one of the things that's coming up this week on March 8 is a birthday um, someone will be turning 85 years old, which uh, he's, he's sitting in the back shaking his head a little bit, but um, Ralph Miller uh, will be 85 this week, and so we want to celebrate that with him and sing happy birthday to him this morning, if you would join me. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday. Ralph, we want to welcome the, the rest of your family that is also here with you and worshiping with you this morning, so we're glad you're all here. Wanted to give a few updates on uh, some of our prayer needs and concerns. Uh, Chuck, uh, is, uh, Chuck Bontrager is move, has moved to Courtyard. Uh, he'll be there, and so if you want to visit him there, you can do that. We also want to continue to remember Oliver Yutzi, uh, who had a light stroke uh, about a week ago and is continuing to recover. And uh, I think he's here this morning, is that right? Yep, okay, good to see you, Oliver. And then Herman Hall had outpatient surgery and, and he is here with us also this past week. I believe he's here, yeah. Um, I want to... Uh, also extend our condolences to Matt and Velda Ash and Floyd and Leanne Schrock in the passing of Velda's father and Leanne, uh, Leanne's grandfather. And uh, the services were last week. I know many of you have also been in prayer for uh, Benji and Benji Ash, and we want to continue to remember that family uh, together. So I invite you to um, join with me as we lift these things in prayer before God. And before I do that, I just remembered, I'd like to invite you, if you have a prayer need that hasn't been mentioned this morning, but you would like us to remember you, uh, to go ahead and stand at this time, and people near you will look around and see who's there. All right, thank you very much. I invite you to join me in prayer. Lord God, as we come together to worship, it is you who receive the glory and the honor and the praise for, for all that we are and all that we do. We are grateful to you for your provisions for us. And Lord, as we come, we also recognize that so many ways our lives are broken and we need your healing touch. And we lift up Oliver and Herman and Velda and Leanne and their families, for Benji, and also for others who are not able to be there, be, be here this morning because of their health. Lord, in all of these ways that we need your touch, and we also pray for those who stood, that whatever need they might have, that you would meet them where they're at and bless them in a special way. We lift up those who are in prison for Vince, Mark, Jason, William, and Michael, that you would continue to be with them and walk with them. Lord, we also pray for the Mennonite schools in Pennsylvania that are participating in an in-service tomorrow that you would uh, give a sense of renewal and encouragement to the teachers and staff. Lord, we do celebrate your kingdom's work, and we, we celebrate with Ralph and Elizabeth this morning and their life and their legacy that they continue to leave. Pray you to be with them and their families today. Lord, we also remember and celebrate um, 
just the service that has been done through the week as each person in this congregation has given of themselves to others in their life in some significant way, and I pray that you would continue to bless that. Lord, may you also come and meet us where we're at in our brokenness as we need your forgiveness and your life in us. As we receive what you have given us and your forgiveness, we also forgive those around us. Lord, keep us from being dragged down and pulled into the short-sighted ways of thinking that pull us back into sin, but empower us to live a new life, a life that is founded in you. Lord, everything is yours, and we give you the glory and honor. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I would like to invite Danny and uh, Steve Weeby Johnson to come up to the front, and uh, they will share with us. I'm Steve Weeby Johnson, Africa Director with Mennonite Mission Network, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, you all have a very long history of support of ministry in Africa, and I'm deeply grateful for the many years that you supported Phil and Christine Lindell Detweiler, and the way you've continued in supporting ministry in South Africa uh, with uh, Joe and Anna uh, <laughs> Swatsky, I want to say Lichty. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to be here to celebrate this morning as uh, Danny and Gerald and Jane Yoder and Pete and Jan Bontrager and Steve Schrock and Dale and Jeanette Hathaway. Dave, sorry. He said I couldn't read his writing, so I proved that. Um, will be going tomorrow, headed for South Africa. They'll be visiting in Peter Maritzburg area, where we have uh, colleagues who are, and MCC working in uh, conjunction with each other, and the Anabaptist Network, and a variety of other ministries. And then part of the group will continue on to Umtata, where uh, Joe and Anna have been serving the past five or six years by now and they have been working with African independent churches. And some of you would have learned a little bit about that last uh, two weeks ago when Thomas Oduro was speaking at the, uh, the Wednesday evening gathering. And I'm excited about this because, you know, the way that mission works at this point in, in, in this, the arc of God's God's working in our world is that agencies like our own, we, in a lot of ways, Mennonite Mission Network has a lot of history and represents a long history of, of service in many, many parts of Africa. We've just celebrated 100 years of, of service in Congo, and, and the church itself, the Mennonite church, has been transformed through mission in Africa. We have more Mennonites in Africa than in uh, any other part of the world. In fact, more than one in five uh, Mennonites are Africans. And so they are uh, a big part of the shift from uh, a European church to a global church. And so uh, Africa ministry has been a very important part of changing and transforming the Mennonite Church. The two things that I think about when I think about mission, because they're, they're, uh, we, we're surrounded by critics of mission and supporters of mission, but the thing of it is for me is that God has called us, in the story of Abraham, we hear that God invites Abraham to be a blessing to all nations. And through, through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. And in Revelation, we read about that God's desire is that people of all tribes and nations will gather around the throne of God in worship. And for me, being a part of mission is being part of that great thrust, that great arc of history that is drawing all people 
into loving relationship, not only with each other, but with God. And this mission trip is one small part of that, one drop or grain of sand, but it's a very important part of the way that God is doing, bringing people unto, unto uh, the divine presence. So I'm very grateful, Danny, for you and all those who are going on this trip, and I'll uh, pass the word over to you. Thank you for sharing with us, Steve. Uh, like Steve has already mentioned, those that are going, I don't have to repeat those names, but uh, we're going to be spending, we're going to be going about two and a half weeks. Uh, we'll be leaving tomorrow morning, and uh, we're going to be spending time with uh, Jesse Bontrager, Pete and Jan's son down there, and uh, then we'll be moving on and uh, spending time with Joe and Anna Swatsky. And, and for me personally, I'm not sure what all they have in store for us down there, but I'm excited to, to go down there and just connect with a different culture and see how God is working in a different culture. And I'm ex especially excited to find out, because uh, I hear a lot about how fast the Mennonite church is growing in Africa, and I'm, for me personally, I'm excited to, uh, to see how, what, what's making that happen, and hopefully, I can bring some stuff back here that maybe help us here. I, that's that's what my desire is, and uh, I uh, and I'm just uh, grateful for all those that are going. and And I would just want to especially thank Gerald Yoder for getting all the logistics uh, put together here for us to be able to go. Uh, he's done a lot of hard work, and I, I just thank him for that. And uh, so, I guess just remember us in prayer. Uh, for me, it's the first time I've even out of the country, so. Uh, uh, it's going to be a different experience for me. Uh, I know Gerald has been over there many times. Steve's been out of the country, and I think Pete and Jan, I think all of them have except me, so I, I must be the rookie in the, of the bunch here, but uh, I'm going along anyhow. So uh, just remember us in the next couple weeks. So uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Gerald and Jane and Pete and Jan and Steve uh, to come up front and all the rest of them, uh, the Outreach Commission, all those that are here from the Outreach Commission to come up and also invite the pastoral team up. So. Let's join in prayer for them this morning. God, we thank you and we praise you this morning for your global church. And we thank you for the way that you are moving and the work that you are doing in the lives of people in Africa. We thank you for people like Joe and Anna Sawaski and their family who have dedicated their life to being there and serving you in that setting. And we thank you for Jesse Bontrager and the work that he's doing with MCC. We thank you for young people who are willing to give up their lives for you in this way. And just now we ask you to bless these who are going, who'll be leaving tomorrow. We pray that you will keep them safe. We pray for your protection on them. But we pray more than anything else, God, that they may be representatives of us here at Clinton Frame and showing your love to Jesse and Joe and Anna and their children and also to anyone who they come into contact with. And we think especially of the church and the school and the people there who Joe and Anna relate to. God, I pray that through this experience, the lives of each one of these people will be touched and the lives of the people who they come into contact with will have a deeper sense of who you are. So we give you the honor and the glory and the praise and the opportunities that you give us just to serve you and to show your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite the ushers to come to the front. 
If you look at the cards in front of you, if you want to fill these out for service this week, that's a part of our offering. And we're going to ask you to turn them into the, these two aisles here. So turn them that way, and there will be junior high kids that are going to collect them. And a reminder for the MYF and junior MYF, if you were here on Wednesday and you did service, make sure you fill those hours out and turn those in. So I invite you to pray with me as we receive this morning's offering. Lord, we do thank you for your blessings that you've given us, the ways that we can serve you with our money and with our time. And as we tithe both of those this morning, we offer them to your service and for your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to stand at this time as we sing together.
thank you for everyone here today bringing us together to worship and just give power to Mel as he gives us a message today. Just be with him. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thanks, youth group. What an exciting journey we're on right now in these Come Hungry series. I listened to Terry's message last Sunday and uh, just amazing story of uh, Jesus being at Simon's house of Pharisee here at the table and this woman bursts in unannounced and unnamed. We don't know what her name was, but just bursts in the door and starts crying and washing Jesus' feet. And Terry ended by, by talking about worship, what worship is really about. I hope today that in this series we're kind of focused right up to the day to Resurrection Sunday and today I hope it's kind of personal to us. Um, we have a table set up here and I don't know if you remember where you sat at the table usually. I come from a big family and us boys sat in the back and we would go by stair step by our age. They were 11 of us and all, and uh, my sister sat in the front. And I'm the only one in the whole family that had light hair. All the rest of them were brunettes or dark, and now and then we'd have guests from out of town, and my father would be introducing us, and invariably the guests said on the end, they'd come back when my father finished, and they'd point their finger at me, where'd you get him? <laughs> And one day, Mother and I were in the kitchen all by ourselves, and I said, okay, Mom, tell me the truth. Where'd you get me? <laughs> I said, you get me mixed up in the hospital? And she assured me that I, that I belonged. Well, I don't know how you experienced family, but as we go through this message today, I hope that you can ask these personal questions as to where your standing is at this table. The background of today's message is that Jesus is at a prominent Pharisee's house, and he's being watched like a hawk. What's he going to do? Can we catch him in something? And sure enough, it was the Sabbath, and he didn't start out very well because he went and healed a man right on the Sabbath, and so that upset them. And then he was a rather assertive guest, he noticed that they were kind of jockeying for the prime seats at this prominent Pharisee's home, and so he just stopped in the middle of that and said, you know what, if you're invited to a place or something like a wedding, he said, go sit in back and let the people invite you up rather than go take a prominent seat, and then they got to move you back. And then he gave this principle that if you try to be exalted in this world, you're going to be humbled. But if you really humble yourself, God's going to raise you up and exalt you. And then he turned to the host and said, I'd like to give you a little counsel. He said, next time when you make a meal, don't just invite your family and friends and your rich neighbors and your social circle. He said, look outside of that and invite those that are crippled, lame, blind, that really need your meal. They very likely don't have the means to invite you back. And he said, that's really going to be the lasting reward. And there was a guy sitting there at that meal, and he was just overwhelmed with what was happening. And he turns to Jesus, and he said, blessed are those who are going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven and eat with you. He caught the essence of a bit of what was going on, and he looked forward to that time of the great marriage supper of the Lamb that the book of Revelation talks about where we're all going to be together. And he kind of caught that, and that became the background of this story that Jesus told. It's a parable. Parable comes from the Greek word parabolum, which means a story built around some really precious truth that Jesus wants to make practical, that we can understand. And so, we want to look at this parable. It's found in Luke chapter 14. 
And because Jesus told it as a parable, I'd like to just tell it this morning as the way I kind of imagine him telling it rather than read it. Jesus, after this man says to him that uh, blessed are those who can eat with you in the kingdom of heaven, he's, he says this. He says, a man made a great banquet. And he invited a lot of guests. And as the practice was in Eastern culture, they got the invitation ahead of time. They could set their date, arrange their schedule. But on the night of the meal, he sends his very own servant out and says to him, tonight's the night, come. And uh, so the servant goes and knocks on the first door and says, hey, remember, you got your invitation? The man I work for has made a great banquet. He wants you to come. And the guy says, oh, man, yeah, I remember that. But he said, uh, in the meantime, I went and bought, bought a field. And I never looked at it. And tonight, I've got to go check it out. Please have me excused. So he goes on to the next home, knocks on the door. Man I work for has made a great banquet, and he wants you to come. The night's the night. It's all ready. And you go, oh, man, he said, I bought me five yoke of oxen. Five yoke. Ten oxen all together. And he said, I never, never checked or tried them out. He said, I got to go try them. Please have me excused. So he goes on to the next home, knocks on the door. He said, the man I work for has made this great banquet, and he wants you to come. He says, oh, man, I just buried me a wife. And he said, I can't come. Please have me excused. And the guy who's hosting the feast by this time is feeling really upset. And he says to his servant, he said, you go out in the city alleys, and everywhere around this town, and you invite anybody you can, the lame, the crazy, you bring him into my house. Because he said, my house is going to be filled with somebody. And so he came back and said, I got that done. There's still room. And he said, okay, go even beyond town. Go out in the country, in the highways and byways, invite people. Get them in here. Because my house will be full. And he said, not one of those who originally were invited are going to taste this banquet meal. Let's pray. Dear God, as we think of this story this morning, I pray that you'll just help us to kind of see where we are right now in our journey with you and be able to check our own heart where we are on this banquet invitation. And whether we would excuse our behavior or whether we'd be there, and I pray that you'll talk to us as only you can through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The banquet was a prepared place. The Bible says, come, everything is now ready. I don't know if, as you remember your, your, your home place, but my mother was an ace at making home a prepared place. I had a favorite pie, and you think of all the kids we had in our family, she would forget that, but it was a berry that grows up in a weed in the garden at fall. It's actually called a, a wild huckleberry. But you have the weeds in the garden at fall, and, and that berry pie is really good. And my mom would every year take the time out and make that berry pie for me. And you, you, you just felt that, that mom had that prepared place. Well, this guest made this banquet, and he prepared it. It reminds me of John 14, where Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. It's a prepared place. And you sense that. Come, for everything is now ready. Being invited to a banquet is being invited to a place of blessing, celebration, and provision. In this story, in this parable, a banquet was a place of intimacy. It was a place where ultimately the teaching here is you come into Jesus' presence. It's where you enjoy Jesus. It's where you enjoy sitting at his feet. It's where you enjoy his word. You enjoy his, 
character and joy, the blessings of God, the provision of God. It's a place where you enjoy Jesus. And we're invited to the banquet to satisfy our hunger. Come hungry. That's the series. We were to come hungry. Come hungry this morning. Come hungry for God. Come hungry for his word. Psalm 42.1 says there's even a greater hunger in the human heart. As a deer panteth after the water brook, so my soul panteth after you, O God. And we find in life that people will try to substitute all kinds of things to satisfy this hunger. And we're going to notice that in the, in, in the guest this morning in this parable. People turn to all kinds of things to try to meet the empty need, the vacuum that's there. As a teenager, I wasn't walking with Christ, and I remember trying to have something going all the time so I wouldn't think about it. But now and then I'd catch myself home for a night, and I'd look out my north window, and I'd say, God, somewhere out there, you are, you're, you're out there somewhere. But I'd feel the empty vacuum in my heart. Notice the invitation. Many guests were invited, and they were very likely in this guy's social circle. Many guests. They received an invitation ahead of time so they could mark their calendar and set their priorities. And on the night of the banquet, notice in the story, the host sent his servant out to remind the guests, tonight's the night. And then you have this phrase that just jumps out at you. They all alike begin to make excuses. Now, there were many guests, and we only have three excuses, so I believe the writer of this passage believed that you could, Jesus, in his parable, could group these excuses in these three. And all the guests that they came to, they kind of come up to these three excuses. And that's why they're important for us to look at this morning. Benjamin Franklin once said, he that is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. George Washington Carver said, 99% of the failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. Don Wilder said, excuses are the nails used to build a house of failure. I believe that excuses often hinge on a lie. A lie to guard ourselves, protect ourselves. They're kind of like a guarded lie. We kind of protect ourselves when we make an excuse. I read once of four teenagers that were late for school. They didn't arrive till noon. And they told the teacher they had a flat tire. And the teacher was so understanding, so sympathetic. She said, flat tires can take a long time, especially if you don't have a spare. But she said, since you missed all forenoon, I have a test for you to take. And she set one of them in each of the four corners of the room, and the test had one question. Which tire was flat? <laughs> have you listened to your excuses lately? Some of them are absolutely silly sometimes. I was in this church out in eastern Pennsylvania, and often in meetings, they like to start the, the, the renewal meetings on Sunday morning where you get most of the crowd hoping they'll come back. This church decided to start on Wednesday night and conclude on Sunday. So on Sunday morning, this guy came up to me, and he felt guilty for missing most of the week. In fact, he only showed up on Sunday morning. And he said to me, oh, man, I'm really sorry for missing the week. He said, I was home studying my Sunday school lesson. I mean, that really, really got my curiosity going. I said to him, man, I said, what Sunday school class do you teach? And this guy must be really a good teacher. He said, well, I teach the young married. I said, no, I, I want to just understand you're right. You were home Wednesday night studying your Sunday school. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, last night. Well, he said, I really didn't get down to it till this morning. But he was so used to making an excuse and letting people let him get by with it that we tend to do it. And we don't think about how our excuses sound. <coughs> Let's notice these three categories. The first group of guests not to show up said, 
I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Now, I really think, it, it really is unlikely that he went and bought a field, bought a piece of property and never looked at it. You think he did? I think it was a protected, guarded lie. I think his family saw him night after night, day after day, as a man with wrong priorities. Buying a field wasn't wrong. In fact, it, it might have been a really wise investment. But what was happening here was that even though possessions can be a very good thing and nothing wrong with them, the possessions were calling him louder than the banquet. The possessions seemed to be more important than coming into the presence of Jesus when he had the chance to do that, to come to the banquet of fellowship, of intimacy, of God's presence, the Lord's table. He chose his possessions. And I think day after day, night after night, his family probably felt wounded, saying, where's Dad going again? What's happening? Why can't he be with us more? And today, more than any other thing you hear is people growing up in a generation where they sometimes feel like parents are absent. Wrong priorities. And so it was... The possessions can be one of the primary reasons we make excuses for not feasting at the Lord's table. What do you think your excuses sound like in this area? Maybe it's a snowmobile, a four-wheeler, or the last thing you bought. Possessions. The tragedy is, as long as we get by making our excuses, we forfeit the chance that we're going to change our behavior. We'll just keep going on in it. The second group of guests not to show. He said he bought five yoke of oxen. That's 10 oxen. That's a really big investment. I was in India one time where they work with oxen. They don't have reins on them like horses. They have like a stick and they're plow. They were plowing rice when I watched them. And through the word, a command or tap of the stick, it was really, really important that these oxen were well trained to get work done. You think this guy bought five yoke of oxen. He said he's got to go prove them. He's got to try them out. He's got to test them. You believe that? I don't. I believe it was a lie to protect himself, thinking he wouldn't need to go to the banquet and could get by with it some way and be understood. To me, this second category of people represent our whole labor and commercial system day. Our jobs, our work, it's important. But I'm amazed today how many people just think like the almighty worker job just trumps everything else rather than coming to the banquet table, the presence of Jesus. And to begin to make decisions and priorities out of that. I remember when that book came out, Being a Mary in a Martha World. I thought it was a really good book. I used to read that story in the Bible and feel like, man, Jesus wasn't fair to, to Martha. She's one that was working all the time, and whenever he'd come, she was preparing the meals and all of that. And it really is a good thing when, when, when we when we're really have a work ethic and all that. But again, the story is you can just take a really good thing and just twist it a little bit as to where our work trumps everything else. And it begins to be the bottom line, and it begins to vo hear the voice that we're hearing constantly is our work, things that we need to do in our work. And it drives us into places sometimes where, where we say, well, how did we get here? John Hall, who owned Maple City True Value Hardware for years and died we were close friends, and sometimes when I'd go into John Hall's story, he'd say, you got a minute, and we'd go downstairs and sit in one of the boxes in the basement, and we'd talk. One day we were down there, John said, man, Mel, he said, I worked my whole life for this store, and I added to it. He said, I was open Sundays for a while, and he said, that really didn't work very good. But he said, I'm getting to feel like I put my ladder against the wrong building. So I'm spending all my life on this store. And he said, 
what really counts in life? And down there not sitting on them cardboard boxes. We prayed together because John felt like just the work. After a while, it's just absolutely empty when that's all it is. Again, work is a wonderful thing. But God wants us to make a ministry out of it and keep him first in it. The third one, and there's times when I've told this story where people think that the third one is the only one that had a legitimate excuse. I tend to feel like he's the one that was the biggest failure. Just got married and I cannot come. It was his responsibility to lead his wife and later on when child number one, two, and three come on the scene, it was his responsibility to lead his family to the banquet table. It was his privilege. That was his call. And instead, he shirked his responsibility. You know, families, I, I, but families can be terribly selfish sometimes. We can be just totally self-absorbed with our stuff and our schedule. I've already had some moms and dads after this, you know, here in this church, sometimes we have people disappear in the winter. We know where they're going. We have people disappear in the summer. It tends to be more the younger couples. I used to have some of these younger couples come up to me and said, man, we miss church most of the summer because they're following their child in a ball team around somewhere. And I grew up in a sports family. I love sports. And again, Jesus is not talking about bad stuff here. He's talking about stuff that tends to yell at us louder than coming to the banquet table. And so, Dad, what do your excuses sound like? Mother, have you thought about what your excuses sound like? Time ago, a mother told me, she said, if I do sit down to want to read to my kids or something, they're all over me, and they're, you know, and I, and she finally said, you know, she said, I think it's because they're not used to me doing that at all. As long as we make excuses, our behavior will not change. The great invitation was that the Lord's table is going to be full. He'll turn to others to fill his house if we make excuses. Not one of those who made excuses got to taste his great banquet. This morning, when I think of this table, what is it going to take for those guests who made excuses to get here? This parable in its actual meaning, when it says that not one of those invited is going to get the taste of the banquet. He's kind of talking about the, the final day. But we're not at that place this morning. We're still welcome at this table. And what would it take for those guests who made excuses to get here? The book of Revelation talks about a people a church at Laodicea that was neither hot nor cold. They were used to making excuses. They were part of Glenn Campbell's song of the rhinestone cowboy. He said, there's a heaping amount of compromising to my, meet my horizon. And so excuses and compromising, where does it get us? Ed and I stood in the lukewarm waters of Laodicea, the ruins of it. It was about this time of the year. There was snow on the ground. We took our shoes off, and we stood in that water. It was neither warm, neither hot, nor cold. And Jesus used that as an illustration and said, you know, I wished you were either hot or cold. Either one is desirable if you were just hot or cold. I put up here this morning a Pepsi. I'm not going to drink it. But when I've been in foreign countries, I've drank a lot of warm pop. 
In Jesus' day, you had to be pretty creative to get this cold. To get it cold. You had to do something. Somebody took some effort, a series of, of decisions to get this cold. A hot cup of coffee. In Jesus' day, to get coffee hot, somebody had to act, make decisions, a series of them, to get this coffee hot. If I let it sit up here all week, here at Clinton Frame, what's going to happen is it's going to become the temperature of this room. It doesn't have to do anything. It'll just become the temperature of the climate around it. And so the church at Laodicea yells at us this morning to repent. If we're making excuses, it's a dead-end street. It's going to get us to a place where we don't want to get to. And if we're going to change, we have to do something. We have to make a decision. We've got to act. And the story of Revelation says, repent. Yeah, excuses are something we need to repent for. Because they're guarded lies. And they're devastating. They go down a path, kind of a slippery path. Just get us where we don't want to go. And we're going to miss the banquet. So this morning, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. and We're going to, in closing this morning, sing a song that we've kind of chosen as a theme song that speaks to our coming hungry. It speaks to doing something. It speaks to what I've noticed in your literature here that many of you people hold very high. And that's the Spirit's work among us. And you recall in John, Gospel of John, Jesus attending the Passover, and it says it's the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the last great day of the feast. And he stands up because they're doing something special. They've gone down to the Pool of Siloam, and they've gotten water out of that living water called sometimes Hezekiah's pool because Hezekiah channeled over 1,700 feet through rock to hook up the pool of Siloam with living, running water, the spring of Gion. So for the first time, the city of Jerusalem got this running water, and they dedicated a psalm to it. There is a river whereof which make it glad the city of God at that time. Well, now the best they can do on this great day of the feast, they go down to the pool of Siloam and get pitchers of water, and they're pouring it out on a rock, symbolizing that rock in the Old Testament where a river come out of, and all at once in the meeting, Jesus stands up, and the Bible says, he cried with a loud voice, if any man thirst, any woman thirst, any child thirst, let him come unto me. And he said, out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water, and the Bible says this, he spoke of the spirit which was to come. I had a dream the other night about Clinton Frame. I had a dream that the Holy Spirit was pouring out that river. And all he wanted us to do was to take our container and put it under it. Because he's going to fill his house one way or another, with or without us. And we don't want to miss it. And our excuses take us down a road where we will. Let's stand together as we sing this song.
that bottom of your seat and come up here so that I can do this. Other times you may do it just where you are. The Word of God calls for a verdict. You say yes to it or no to it, maybe. Neutral, we cannot be. change our patterns in Jesus. 